In this video, we shall discuss the topic of centripetal force. We will explain what is centripetal force, namely the idea and concept behind it, how it is related to centripetal acceleration that we saw in previous video, and finally how to use the concept we learned to solve problems associated with centripetal force. Let's assume you have this object. It's moving in a uniform circular motion with a constant speed of v meter per second. We know that this object will be accelerating towards the center like that, and that acceleration, it's called the centripetal acceleration with the expression of v squared over r. And this acceleration is in a radial direction, namely it is pointing towards the center. We also know from Newton's second law, if there is an acceleration, there must be a net force, and they are related like that, F net equals to MA. And since there is this acceleration, there must be a net force that's causing that acceleration. Now that net force is called the centripetal force. And the direction of this net force follows the direction of the acceleration. So the direction of the centripetal force is the same as the direction of the centripetal acceleration, namely towards the center of the circle. So let's denote the centripetal force with a subscript C. And using these two expressions, we can write a formula for the centripetal force, namely F sub C equals mass of this object that is going in a circle times V squared over R. So this is just the quantity in the bracket is the centripetal acceleration. It's important to understand that centripetal force is not a new type of force, but a net force that causes centripetal acceleration. So a natural question is, what produces this net force? What produces the centripetal force? This centripetal force is the result of force or combination of forces, such as friction, tension in the string, gravity, just to name a few. We shall see how forces such as friction and tension give rise to centripetal force next. Let's look at an example of a car taking a curve or a roundabout. So it's moving in that direction and at the present location the velocity of the car is going like that. So what is preventing the car from sliding sideways like that? The force that is preventing the sliding of the car sideways is the static friction between the tires and the surface of the road. On the right we show a schematic diagram of how the friction works between the tires and the surface of the road to maintain the car from sliding, to maintain the car in its trajectory. As the car makes this move around this roundabout, it tends to slide in that direction. So in order to avoid that slide, you must have a friction that acts in an opposite direction towards the center. And that friction is static friction, it's not kinetic friction. And the reason is there is no motion in this sideways direction. The motion is purely in that direction. So it is the static friction that comes into play. Of course, one could label other forces on this car, namely the weight and the normal force, so that's the free body diagram right there. But what is causing the net force is just static friction. So the net force is given by this static friction. So what is that net force? That is the centripetal force. So we say the static friction supplies the centripetal force in this case and therefore maintains the car in its circular trajectory. Next, let's look at the mass. 
that is moving in a vertical circle. So the mass is attached to a string and it is being spun around in a counterclockwise motion in a circular trajectory with radius, let's say, r. In particular, we want to analyze what happens to this mass when it gets to that four locations, one, two, three, and four, and how the centripetal force on this object is influenced by tension and the weight of this mass at those four locations. Let's look at location one. At location one, of course, the free body diagram shows that the weight of this object is mg heading downward and the tension is heading leftward. And that's it. And the acceleration, the centripetal acceleration, must also go that way towards the center. So we say that the tension is indeed supplying the centripetal force, which is mass squared of the speed over the radius of the trajectory. Simple as that. In location two, so the free body diagram consists of again two forces. One is the weight mg and also the tension which is heading downward like that and the centripetal force is as we know heading that way towards the center. So we write tension plus the weight so these two forces, they combine to give the net force, which is the centripetal force. So we say tension plus mg, the weight, equals mv squared over r. If you solve the tension for location 2, that is what you get. And as you can see, the tension in position 2 is less than the tension in position 1, as it should. Let's look at position 3. So as always, you have the weight that's acting downward, mg, and tension going to the right. So that is also the direction of the centripetal force. So in this case, again, the tension is indeed supplying the centripetal force for this mass to maintain it in that circular motion, mv squared over r. So you see the tension in position 3 is the same as the tension in position 1. Now position 4. So the weight is down, mg. Now the tension is now up and the centripetal force is always towards the center. So that means tension minus the weight is the centripetal force. So tension is weight plus centripetal force and we can say the tension here is indeed greater than tension in other three locations. This illustration clearly shows how forces such as tension and weight can combine to produce centripetal force that is indeed a net force acting on this rotating mass. Let's look at the following problem. A flat unbanked curve on a highway has a radius of 240 meters. If a car rounds the curve at a speed of 30 meters per second, calculate the minimum coefficient of friction, that is, minimum coefficient of static friction, between the road and the tires of the car that will prevent the car from sliding. We show a schematic diagram of this problem. Now, the direction of motion is, of course, into the screen. And let's label all the forces. So you have the weight of that car. Let's call it W. And then you have this uh, normal force on the car, N. And then, of course, you have friction that is preventing the skidding, static friction that preventing the skidding of the car towards the center. Let's say the center is here. So from our video on friction, we know static friction is given by such an inequality. So mu sub s, mu sub s is the coefficient of static friction that we want to determine, n is the normal force, and f sub s is the static friction. From this free body diagram, we also know that the net force is the centripetal force. So static friction supplies the centripetal force, which is mass times square of speed over the radius of that circular trajectory.
Putting this result into this inequality, we obtain mv squared over r less or equal to mu sub s times n. The normal force is the same as weight, which is mg. So you can write the right-hand side of this inequality like that. So the mass can be cancelled. And let's rewrite this inequality. So I have rewritten this inequality like that. You see that by rearranging the terms, you get v squared over gr. Now what this means is that coefficient of static friction at the minimum can be this expression. If it's less than that, the car will skid. It has to be more than that minimum value. So what is that minimum value? Substituting the expressions for speed, so that is 30 squared. G is 9.81. The radius is 240. And that will give you 0 0.382. That means mu sub s must be greater or equal to 0 0.382 in order for the car to round the curve successfully. So the minimum coefficient of friction is indeed 0 0.382. That solves the problem. So this 3 kg mass in this problem is spinning in a circular trajectory like that about this vertical rod and is connected by two strings, upper and lower string. So we want to determine the tension in the lower string. Upper string tension is given as 90 newtons. We also want to know the speed with which it rounds this orbit and the net force on this 3 kg mass. So the first thing is the free body diagram. So you have this weight, 3 times gravity, this upper tension, which we know, 90 newtons, tension in the upper string. The lower tension is TL, which we don't know. And the acceleration is going towards the center. So that is the centripetal acceleration. Let's call it AC. Now let's write down f equals to ma along the y direction. So that's a vertical direction. The object is not moving in vertical direction. So that means the net force along the vertical direction is zero. So 90 sine alpha, that is the y component of that 90 newton tension, must be balanced by the y component of the lower tension, tl, again, sine alpha, plus the weight, 3g. Now, using Pythagoras' theorem, we can figure out r to be square root 3. And from trigonometry, we know from the right angle triangle given that sine alpha is half. Substituting this half inside here and here, we can calculate the tension in the lower string. And that will turn out to be 31 newtons if you do the calculation. So that is the answer for part A. For part B and C, we need to write down f equals to ma along the x direction, or the that direction. So there are two, co two contributions. The x component of that 90, ten 90 newton tension force is 90 cosine alpha. And it will reinforce the x component of the lower tension, again, tl cosine alpha, because the x component of this tl 90 heading in the same direction, namely to the left. And they will add up to give you the centripetal force, mv squared over r. Now we know what cosine alpha is from the triangle. It's given by square root 3 over 2. Now substituting cosine alpha here and here using TL is 31 newtons. Mass is known, 3 kilograms. V is what we need to find, and R is square root 3. We can find the speed of the mass. And it will be 7.8 meter per second. So that is the answer for part C. Next, the magnitude of the net force. Now we know, and we have said this many times, the net force is just a centripetal force here. And that is given by mass squared of speed over the radius. And when you substitute all these numbers, 3 times speed is 7.8 squared. Square root 3 is the radius. You will get the net force to be 105 newtons. That's the net force on the mass. And that concludes this problem. Thank you for watching.